attend wild parties that led to unsolved mysteries, bad things do happen at parties, especially when the night gets wild and drugs or alcohol are involved, sometimes, a person can die under suspicious circumstances, or get lost in the large gathering of people and just disappear. In certain cases, it seems like the people attending the party might hold a solution, to the unsolved mystery but have sworn themselves to secrecy. 1. The suspicious deaths of Helen Smith and Johanna Sutton, illness and old age seemed to have hardened Ron Smith's cussedness, and made him more inflexible than ever. From his hospital bed only six months ago, the former police officer declared that he would never bury his daughter, Helen, because her body would one day provide forensic evidence that she was murdered, during that infamous illegal drinking party in Jeddah in May, 1979. It's a part of what I've been fighting for all these years. He said, I can't give up now. But this week he suddenly caved in. Helen Smith's cold storage in the mortuary at Leeds General Infirmary is over, after 30 years, the longest time that a body in Britain has remained uncommitted, either to earth or to fire. The day after Remembrance Sunday, her much inspected and incomplete remains will be cremated and with them, you might suppose, all her father's hopes of proving foul play. But anyone who has met Ron Smith, obsessive, injured and coldly angry, or remembers the sensation his daughters fought for British inquest caused in 1982, will know that this is not the end of his hopes, even though he is frail, under pressure from his ex-wife, Gerald, he has been persuaded to lay their daughter to rest, while they are both alive to do it, but he is unable to rest himself, there will never be any closure, he told the Daily Telegraph yesterday. The fact that my daughter is to be cremated and her ashes scattered does not change things. I will go to my grave believing that she did not die in an accident. Closure was not a word that had crossed the Atlantic into popular psychology, when 23-year-old Helen Smith fell from the balcony of the sixth floor flat of Dr. Richard Darnett and his wife, Penny, supposedly either during or after sex with a Dutch tugboat captain, Johannes Otten whose body was found impaled on a spiked fence. Smith wasn't looking for closure, or even aware that he might be sublimating his grief in a crusade. He was looking for answers, like the father of Julie Ward, the young photographer murdered on safari in Kenya 28 years ago, and like Jim Swire, whose 24-year-old daughter died at Lockerbie. Smith has been consumed by the need to act on his suspicions. These fathers turned investigators, with their towers of documents, their whitening hair and their terrible patience, are in it for the long haul. Smith, who is now 83 and having kidney dialysis three days a week near his home in Geisley near Leeds, still believes there will be new Leeds, eventual justice. When he was seriously ill earlier this year, he says, I lost interest in everything, except Helen. When the questionable events of May 20 first unfolded, Ron Smith accepted the official line that Helen had fallen to her death. We were making preparations for the funeral when an article appeared in Private Eye alleging a cover-up, he has explained. He went to Jeddah to find out for himself, the first of several visits, and has not stopped investigating and harrying the authorities ever since. He collaborated with Paul Foote, the campaigning journalist, on a book called The Helen Smith Story, which suggested that incompetence and vested interests had obscured the truth about what had happened. In essence, Smith believes his daughter was raped and murdered, then carried to the street to make it seem as if she had fallen from the balcony. His allegations of a cover-up by the security services of both countries provoked a diplomatic crisis between Britain and Saudi Arabia. Though he has poured his money and his life into proving that she was murdered, after six post-mortems with differing conclusions, the inquest jury's open verdict prevails. Smith's one unarguable success was to have brought about a change in the law. As a result of his insistence that Helen's death should come before an English coroner, in 1982, the Court of Appeal ruled that Britons who die abroad in violent or unnatural circumstances should have a British inquest once their bodies are returned. These were grounds for an inquest for Diana, Princess of Wales. The denouement of the expat gathering at the Arnott's home is murky, even squalid, and attracted worldwide interest. That evening, the Arnott's were hosting a farewell party for Tim Hader a diver from New Zealand. Only two women were present, Helen Smith, a nurse at the Bach Hospital where Dr. Arnett was a surgeon, and Penny Arnett. Alcohol, homemade wine, gin and black market whiskey were on offer in what is a dry country, 
and during the evening Mrs. Arnett had sex with Hayter. Early next morning, Helen's body was found in the street 70 feet below and the partly clothed body of Otten, 35, skewered on railings nearby. A Saudi investigation found that they had fallen from the balcony while having sex, forbidden in that country between unmarried people and decided that the deaths were accidental. The Foreign Office endorsed this conclusion. But Ron Smith's 62-page dossier on the case contains medical statements that show Helen's body had no injuries consistent with such a fall, though there were signs she had been roughly handled or sexually assaulted. In rigor mortis, a doctor noted, her arm was said to have been set at an angle above her head that would have been impossible if she had fallen while alive and she had received a blow to the head that would have rendered her unconscious. A national newspaper reporter who interviewed Smith in Leeds in 1982, a session lasting till 3 a.m. with a fish and chip break at Harry Ramsden's, remembers his obsession with the height of the balcony. It was too high, he argued, for anyone to topple over accidentally. Allegations were made that Saudi guests were present but never named. The Arnett's and most of their guests were arrested and thrown into a crowded, hot and dirty jail for four months, fearing for their lives. Richard Arnett and Tim Hayter were charged with drinking and other social offenses and sentenced to be flogged. Arnett also received a one-year jail term. Penny Arnett was sentenced to a public lashing for unlawful intercourse. Diplomatic maneuvers secured their release and the sentences were never carried out. The Arnett's already shaky marriage collapsed and, in the aftermath of the scandal, Dr. Arnett made a new start as a flying doctor in Australia. Headline the death party doctor in the tabloids, he had effectively been frozen out of his profession in Britain. In an interview for ABC, he once described dining out on his Saudi experiences and the heavy black humor of being nicknamed Le Balconer and considering having balconeering parties. He is now 68, remarried and working as a locum in country practices across New South Wales. Smith blames Dr. Arnett for not doing anything to save his daughter and for concealing what he knew of the tragedy. In an interview to promote his book Arabian Nightmare, in 1999, Dr. Arnett denounced Ron Smith's refusal to allow Helen to be buried as an obscenity, adding, I feel extreme pity that, by all accounts, his life has been totally wrecked. I regard him as a man who has suffered under a terrible delusion. Yesterday, he remembered Helen Smith as a young, Happy go lucky, pleasant girl who died tragically, nothing more or less than that. He said that though her death had affected his life, he had moved on. It was now part of history. I am delighted to hear she is finally being buried. It's a pity she wasn't buried 30 years ago. The whole thing has been a beat up by her father. I doubt Ron Smith will ever be able to put it behind him, but I hope everyone else will now. Dr. Arnett's high spending ex wife, Penelope has fared less well. She married John Close, the son of a wealthy former CIA officer, in 1982, and reinvented herself as an interior designer but they divorced in 2000. Tim Hayter was last known to be working with an oil firm in North Burma. Long personal crusades for retribution are not always just about practical resolution. When John Ward, now 75, recently offered a £78,500 reward, for information leading to the arrest and conviction of his daughter's killers, he derived some satisfaction from knowing that his persistence would chill the murderers. I wanted to show people I am still on the case. Smith himself was pleased that his presence in Jeddah was a source of consternation to the Foreign Office. I caused them a lot of sleepless nights, he once said, and am still doing so. One of the disappointments he must surely feel at having to give his daughter's body up to flames is that he will lose some of his power to disturb the sleep of his adversaries with the threat of new forensic evidence. When he dies, Ron Smith seems to accept that the case will die with him, but until then, his file remains open, too. The New Disappearance of Wojciech Fudeli Fudeli was last seen in Narragansett, Rhode Island on December 6, 2008. He'd attended a party at a friend's home in the 70 block of East Shore Road and stayed overnight. When his friends woke up the next afternoon, Fudeli was gone and the clothing he'd worn the night before was neatly folded on the floor. He also left his sneakers, car keys, cellular phone, Massachusetts driver's license, debit card and $86 in cash. His friends initially believed he's gone for a walk. Fudeli was seen twice after he left his friend's home. Neighbors saw him sitting on a dock at 8.30 a.m., 
naked. Two hours a friend saw him running, still nude, near Galilee Escape Road on the grounds of the 128-acre Galilee Bird Sanctuary. He has never been heard from again. Fudeli was born in Poland and grew up in Wilbraham, Massachusetts. Earlier in 2008, he graduated from the University of Rhode Island with a bachelor's degree in international business. His friends stated he seemed depressed and despondent prior to his disappearance, and was acting oddly the last time they saw him, but his mother spoke to him three days before his disappearance and didn't notice anything wrong. Foodley's roommate stated he had become interested in nature and also very religious, and he spent a great deal of time reading the Bible in the days before his disappearance. They gathered yesterday in Galilee to find answers as well as their missing friend. Wojciech Foodley, 22, a recent University of Rhode Island graduate, avid surfer and nature lover, disappeared December 6 after spending the night at a friend's house on East Shore Drive in Narragansett. He was last seen near Galilee Escape Road that morning around 10.30. Witnesses said that he wasn't wearing any clothes. Yesterday, more than 100 friends, relatives and members of the Uri community, searched the tidal flats on both sides of the Escape Road next to Point Judith. Armed with maps and emergency phone numbers, they searched on foot and in kayaks. As the students fanned out over the marshes, Foodley's mother, Anna Foodley of Wilbraham, Mass., said that the pieces of the puzzle simply didn't add up. Anna Foodley said she spoke to her son three days before his disappearance and there was no hint that anything was wrong. I just want to find him, she said. It doesn't matter what condition he's in, we hope he is alive. A parent is never supposed to outlive a child, Anna said. It isn't part of the natural order. Anna said she has been through this before. She lost her oldest son in an accident a couple of years ago. He was almost 23. Although many acquaintances were stunned by Foodley's disappearance, his roommate, Zachary Diamond of Newport, said Foodley's mental attitude had changed in the last few days before his disappearance. He was questioning things, Diamond said. He was on this stint about nature. He said he wanted to be pure. Foodley seemed to be struggling with profound questions about his existence. Diamond said that Foodley had rejected science in favor of religion and spent time reading the Bible, but he did not seem despondent. He's so mentally strong, Diamond said. He's always so stoked to be around his friends. He is such a good kid, so caring and loving. A college reunion brought Foodley and Diamond back to Uri, where they went to a party with friends. Afterward, Foodley went to stay at the house on East Shore Drive. When his friends woke up late the next morning, Foodley was gone and they assumed he had gone for a walk. When he didn't return, his friends contacted the police. Anna Foodley, however, said the local police didn't begin to search in earnest for her son until 12 hours later, at around 11.30 p.m. Carrie Cope, a friend who helped organize yesterday's search, said an organization called Search Dogs Northeast volunteered their services, but there was an apparent mix-up in communication between that group and the police and the search never happened. The police, however, have said that they searched the area repeatedly with dogs and on foot and said that Coast Guard helicopters were called in to scour the waters around Point Judith. The police also called the last numbers Foodley dialed on his cell phone and sent out automated messages to residents in the Narragansett and Uri communities, asking anyone with information to contact the police. Meanwhile, yesterday's search turned up no leads, but friends refused to give up home. As Cope said, we just want him to come home. Temperatures outside on the day Foodley disappeared were about 30 degrees, and he could not have survived long without his clothes. His case remains unsolved. 3. The Disappearance of Randy Leach Randy was a senior at Linwood High School in 1988. He left his home at 6.30 p.m. to attend a friend's pre-graduation party in a rural area five miles east of her residence on April 15, 1988. Before arriving at the party, he stopped at Stout's convenience store and purchased some candy, soda pop, and gasoline. Then he talked to some friends, then went to DeSoto to check on the car he was restoring. As a result of these errands, Randy did not arrive at the party until between 9.30 and 10 p.m. He was driving his mother's gray four-door 1985 Dodge sedan with the Kansas plate number LVJ8721, and carried about $50 or $60 in cash. There were between 70 and 150 guests at the party, 
and there was considerable drug and alcohol used by the mostly teenaged guests. Witnesses reported Randy was acting drunk, but it's unclear whether he actually consumed any alcohol, and he told a friend he didn't know what was wrong. He may have left the party between 1.30 and 2 a.m., but some witnesses reported seeing him there as late as 2.15, and no one actually saw him leave. Randy never returned home and has not been heard from again. Randy was reported missing by his parents on April 16. He had a 12.30 a.m. curfew at the time he vanished, and usually honored it. His parents slept undisturbed through the night and did not realize their son hadn't come home until they woke up at 6 a.m. They first thought he had been in a car accident and called one of his friends, who said she hadn't heard from him. Randy's parents then contacted police. Investigators went to the site of the party Randy had attended but it had already been cleaned up and there was no evidence to be found. Authorities do not believe Randy left of his own accord, since he left behind the 1966 Dodge Mustang he was restoring and his friends and family say he had no plans to leave home. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do after graduating high school, but he was thinking of enrolling in trade school. His father describes him as an entrepreneur and a hard worker. He was an excellent student and enjoyed outdoor pursuits particularly fishing, in 1988. Randy's parents still live in his old house, and are hopeful that they will someday get the answers as to his fate. The house where the party was held was destroyed by a fire shortly after Randy's disappearance. Rumors circulated that Randy was abducted and killed by a satanic cult, that was supposedly active in the Linwood area. Later in 1988, a man told police that he had been kidnapped by the cult and held in a cave for two weeks and had seen a corpse there that might have been Randy's. Police searched the cave and found no indications that a crime had been committed there. They decided that the man had hallucinated the experience while under the influence of drugs. Three men were arrested in the early 1993, on suspicion of Randy's kidnapping and murder, but they were released, without charge several days later and investigators admitted they'd been mistaken about the men's involvement in Randy's case. An adult acquaintance of Randy's, one of the last people to see him, found a severed foot on the banks of the Kansas River in March 1989. The foot was not Randy's. Randy's parents say the man drove past their house, going only about 10 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour zone. On the morning they discovered Randy's disappearance. The individual has since died and it is not known if he had anything to do with Randy's disappearance. A few other people who attended the party that night are now also deceased. Some reports state that Randy left the party at 6.30 p.m., in fact, that was when he left home to go to the party. He was declared legally dead in 2001. In 2006, his disappearance received additional publicity when a University of Kansas graduate student wrote a play about his case, entitled Leaves of Words. It was performed in Lawrence, Kansas. Randy's case remains unsolved. 4. The Disappearance of Corden Stuffer Scott Stuffer has received dozens of calls from people claiming to have information about his daughter, one told of seeing her alive, in a cage. The person described a spot along Swatera Creek. It was near where another person described seeing her walking along the road. How can I go to bed at night if I know that I heard something that day and I didn't follow up on it? As ridiculous as it possibly could be. He said in an interview this week, Corton Stuffer of Palmyra disappeared 28 days ago after a night out in Harrisburg. Her father, friends and relatives have scoured many spots in search of the 21-year-old or clues to her disappearance. Stuffer has questioned friends and neighbors who were around Corton in the hours, before she seemingly vanished from her West Main Street apartment around 4 a.m. July 29, police, who have executed several search warrants have named no suspects and are releasing little information. Stuffer, however, said his own efforts have revealed she disappeared amid volatile circumstances. Stuffer said his daughter lived with her boyfriend who was on house arrest and probation for driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs while underage. On Saturday, July 28, just hours before she disappeared, there was a gathering at their second floor apartment, and beer, when a probation officer showed up. Her boyfriend was arrested. He ended up spending about a week in prison, Lebanon County court records show. According to Stuffer, his daughter believed the probation violation would trigger a long jail sentence. She became angry at her neighbors, who she thought called police about the party. Later, she met friends and spent the evening at Harrisburg night spots. 
Early Sunday morning, when she and a male friend returned to her apartment, they saw several neighbors in the first floor apartment. Court vented her anger at them, her father said. In an interview this week, Janice Riemann Schneider and Rich Sheets, who live in the apartment below Courtin's, said they saw Courtin kick and swing at Todd Saksk, who lives in the other half of the duplex. They said Courtin's friend stepped between them. The neighbors said Courtin's friend also made hostile remarks toward them. At that point, Riemann Schneider and Sheets said they closed their door and called police. Police got the call shortly after 3 a.m. and stayed until almost 4 when everyone had returned to their apartments. Another call came within 30 minutes. According to Corden's father and neighbors, Saksk called police after Corden stomped on her apartment floor in anger. Police said they knocked on both doors but made no contact with Corden or Saksk. According to Matthew Scott, a Stuffer family friend, Saksk, 44, declined to discuss the night's events on the advice of a lawyer. Stuffer said he had a long conversation with Corden's friend. The man had known her for two years and regarded her as a sister, Stuffer said. He told him he went to sleep after the stomping and believed Corden did, too. The friend woke about 7 a.m. and, not seeing Corden, figured she was sleeping in another room. He went to a nearby convenience store where a surveillance camera recorded him buying food and a drink and texting Corton. Stuffer said he has read the text. Corton's cell phone was left behind, which told Corton he couldn't find her after he awoke and would see her later. Corton also left behind her car, wallet, her dog and another dog that belonged to her boyfriend. So in that narrow window of time, in a small, peaceful town where information spreads far and fast, Corton somehow vanished. Lives overturned. The story of the disappearance of the beautiful young blonde is making national news. Utility poles in Palmyra are plastered with posters asking for information. More than $30,000 in reward money is being offered. Meanwhile, Riemann Schneider, 49, and Sheets, 57, said their lives have been overturned also. They said they allowed police and dogs to search their apartment and have talked extensively with police and Stuffer's family. We have given the police department anything and everything they have asked for, said Sheets, adding that other neighbors also have cooperated fully and allowed searches. Yet people have been driving down the street behind their home and making harassing remarks, as if the neighbors had something to do with the disappearance. They avoid going outside. Riemann Schneider said she's amazed that there seems to be a continued focus on the neighbors, when it's obvious to her that whatever happened to Corden took place elsewhere. The couple believe Corden left her apartment and encountered someone who took advantage of her. Riemann Schneider, who has a college-age daughter, said she prays for Corden continually. Regardless of what she did that night, she was a child of God and a child of good people, and they love her and need her home, she said. Scott Stuffer, 47 admits his suspicions run in all directions. I honestly believe that one of the people that was there that night with my daughter is withholding information. They know something or they know the person who knows something. There is no doubt in my mind, he said. Stuffer said he has spoken with everyone involved in the early morning disturbance. He said he's also learned of potentially dangerous circumstances beyond his daughter's immediate neighborhood. On that night in Harrisburg, for example, when Corton argued with a young man and his girlfriend, she was thrown out of the bar. Stuffer said Corton knew the man, but he doesn't know the source of the dispute. He said another man had been angry with Corton because she owed him money. Corton worked as a hairstylist and pet groomer and he had done modeling. She was fond of peace signs, and many likened her to a flower child. One of five children, she was close to her siblings and her parents who divorced in 2005. Stuffer owns a business just outside Fort Indiana Town Gap that distributes equipment including environmental recycling machines. The office is decorated with mounted deer heads, family photos and youth sports trophies. Stuffer said his daughter has many friends whom he knows well and likes, but she also had newer friends, who he believes were involved with drugs and whom she didn't bring around her parents. It's not that she was there 24-7, but she put herself in that environment enough to basically, I think, allow those people to change the course of her life," he said. On the Saturday night before she disappeared, Corton parked her car at a gas station before traveling to Harrisburg with friends in a different vehicle. The friend who returned home with her was a designated driver of another friend's vehicle. 
and they dropped that friend off in Palmyra before returning to Corton's. Police have executed a search warrant of the vehicle of the friend who was dropped off, as well as of Corton's 2002 Ford Focus and her apartment. The warrants are sealed, but Scott Stuffer has grown frustrated with the investigation. He believes surveillance cameras at local businesses weren't checked until some had recorded over footage from July 29th. During this interview, he took a call from a friend who owns a helicopter. Stuffer wants to conduct an air search of areas including local quarries. He said he won't stop until he finds Corton, although he has begun to brace for the outcome he dreads. Nor will he rest until he learns the facts behind her disappearance. I want her found, either way. I want her found for my family, and I want her found for her. I want her to know she matters, that she's not just transient person they could just take advantage of and nobody's going to do anything he said. I want those people looking over their shoulders every day until we find my daughter. 5. The beating death of Joel Lovelian, a cowboy, a clown, a lion and a hockey fan walk into a bar. It sounds like the opening of a joke, but the punchline isn't funny. The hockey fan winds up dead in the parking lot outside the bar, and his killer fades away into the night. Six years after 38-year-old Joe Lovelian was beaten to death outside the Broken Drum Lounge and Casino in Grand Forks, N.D., his killer is still at large. From the start, solving the crime has been made difficult by the day it occurred, the Saturday before Halloween. The victim, the witnesses and a long list of possible suspects were in holiday disguises as they partied that night and one of the only pieces of physical evidence was a blood speck piece torn from one of their costumes. Grand Forks has a population of only 53,000, but North Dakota has more bars per capita than any other state in the nation. On October 27, 2007, a group of about 40 or 50 20-somethings had chartered a bus for a Saturday night slalom through the city's many watering holes. As police would discover, the riders included a cowboy, a hunter, a lion, a gangster and a faux Paris Hilton, and many jello shots were consumed as the coach rolled through town. The bus pulled up to the broken drum and the revelers spilled out. Inside, Joe Lovelian, dressed in the bright green jersey of his favorite hockey team, the University of North Dakota's Fighting Sioux, was already celebrating Halloween with his fiancée, Heather Easterling, 31, was dressed as a mechanic. Lovelian had met the grade school teacher less than a year earlier but they had already set a wedding date. Lovelian indulged in a cigar, and played blackjack. The party bus was outside, ready to take its riders to the next stop. At about 11.30 p.m., said Easterling. Lovelian got a call on his cell phone and went outside to take it. Soon Lovelian came back inside, recalled Easterling, and said, Hey, somebody got left by the bus. I'm going to go check on him. He kissed me and went outside. A few minutes later, another bar patron came running back inside, yelling, Call 911, to Easterling's shock. The person who needed emergency help was her fiancé. When she ran outside, she found Lovelian on the pavement. Joe was laying there with blood all over the cement near his head in the parking lot, recalled Easterling, crying. We couldn't get a response out of him. Lovelian was rushed to the ER in the same hospital where he worked as a computer technician. But the doctors couldn't save him. They later determined that he'd been beaten so badly that the bones in his face had broken and he had choked to death on his own blood. At the broken drum, authorities were scrambling to find possible witnesses and suspects. The party bus had left, but there were about 80 people still at the bar, and the police began to piece together a narrative. They got descriptions of individuals seen near Lovely and or the bus, a clown, a cowboy, a gangster, a construction worker, and dashed out to look for them, around the city before they could take off their costumes and disappear. If you're going to find the Penguin and the Joker and the rest of them, said Grand Forks Police Chief John Packett, you've got to find them pretty quick. They had also found a piece of evidence at the murder scene. It was yellow, and had a spot of blood on it. It looked like a foot or a paw from a costume. Soon, the police found the clown at another Grand Forks bar. He was crying and his hands were shaking. The tears of the clown made police suspicious. The clown, a 22-year-old farmer, told police he was crying because he'd had a fight with his girlfriend. But he clammed up and demanded a lawyer when investigators brought him to the police station for questioning. The police also found the cowboy, 
but they say he gave them a false name and birth date and became physically aggressive. They placed him in handcuffs temporarily, but did not arrest him. According to police, the cowboy did ask an interesting question, though. He wanted to know if the victim was wearing a green shirt with the initials UND on it, like Loveland's North Dakota hockey jersey. Had the cowboy witnessed the fight that killed Loveland? The next day, police asked the clown and other witnesses to come back down to police headquarters. Now sober and cooperative, the cowboy and clown told a story that police felt exonerated them and other potential suspects on the bus. While the bus was at the Broken Drum, the partygoers said, two of the passengers got into a fight outside the bar. One was a friend of theirs who was dressed as a hunter. The other was a guy in a crude lion costume fashioned out of a yellow hoodie. After the fight, they told the lion he couldn't get back on the bus, before it pulled away. They said, they saw the lion speaking to a guy in a green hockey jersey. Six. The disappearance of Randy Evers. In the thousands of cases that cross the desks of Metro Police, missing person detectives there is always someone who saw something, heard something or knows something. Detectives Mark Redden and Gary Sayre can usually ferret out something to go on, a clue that can be used to track the missing person down, or at worst reveal what happened to them. But the case of Carla Rodriguez, who seems to have disappeared without a trace, bucks that trend and builds the frustration for those charged with finding her. The frustration is not that we can't solve the disappearance, but that we just don't have a direction to go in," Redden said. We have no eyewitnesses. Someone had to have seen something, but no one has come forward. It has been a little over six months since seven-year-old Carla Rodriguez was last seen playing with friends on a Wednesday evening in the 700 block of Bonita Avenue, northeast of the intersection of 6th Street and Street. Louis Avenue, she disappeared just blocks from her house, sparking a massive door-to-door -door manhunt and national media attention. About 30 binders fill two three-feet long shelves in the detective's office, bulging with tips, information and interviews that have been conducted since Carla vanished. We've had all kinds of sightings and tips, Redden said. Everything from an apartment manager finding a backpack in an empty apartment, that he thought could be Carla's to someone seeing a girl they thought looked like Carla on a picnic at Mount Charleston. Another tip took detectives to the Glass Pool Inn, 4613 Las Vegas Boulevard, South. But the December 13th search of the motel for someone who might know the whereabouts of Carla went nowhere. This far along the chances of this being solved aren't good, Sarah said. The only other case I can remember where we had no eyewitnesses like this is Randy Evers. Randy Evers was three years old when he disappeared sometime late February 15th or early February 16, 1992, from the living room of the apartment his father and stepmother rented at 313 East Rochelle Avenue. According to the story told by Evers' parents, a birthday party for the father, Mike Evers, had broken up and he was sleeping in a back bedroom. Tina Evers, the stepmother, had left the apartment with friends to continue the party at a casino. Randy was last seen on the living room floor, near a couch where an adult who had attended the party passed out. When Tina Evers arrived home early on February 16 Randy was gone. The disappearances of Rodriguez and Evers remain open with no solid leads, as to what happened to the children. Tips come in with less and less frequency as the cases get older. But amazingly there are still calls about Evers eight years after he was last seen, and that buoys hopes for finding him and Rodriguez, Nevada Child Seekers Executive Director Jill Limerger said. We never, ever give up, and we still follow every single lead we get, Limerger said. We want every case to have a happy ending, but when you get these cases that go unsolved for so long it just tears your heart, because you know that whatever situation these kids are in it's not a good one. Police have eliminated all but a few scenarios for what could have happened to Rodriguez. She could have been abducted by a pedophile passing through town, or she may have run across a pedophile in her neighborhood, Redden said. A lot of sex offenders pass through here and stay, because there are so many new people moving into town and they can just blend in. The third possibility is that someone from her extended family took her and she is in Mexico, but we have pretty much eliminated that. The FBI and other law enforcement agencies have checked through Rodriguez's large, extended family in Mexico, but came up empty. We've been through all this so many times by now, that we're pretty much down to hoping that someone in the family has her somewhere and is afraid to come forward to police, 
Sarah said. The two Metro detectives have been concentrating on keeping Carla's name and face fresh in the public's mind in hopes it will jog someone's memory and lead to something that will point toward the missing girl. Most recently Carla's picture has been appearing on purely Sedona bottled water, and was on the hood of Jonah McKeck's stock car at Saturday's Bush Series Auto Club 300 at the California Speedway. The detectives are on call 24 hours a day and respond to any tip about Carla so they can't help but take the case home with them," Sarah said. Finding Carla definitely will be a relief, Sarah said. When we find the kids and they're okay we feel like we've done our best. 7. The Disappearance of Marie Blee Marie attended a 4-H dance at the Pavilion in Craig, Colorado on November 21, 1979. Afterwards she went to a party at the Shadow Mountain Village Mobile Home Park with her friend, Marty Dean Doolin. Some of Marie's female friends were with them also, and became alarmed because people at the party were using drugs and most of the guests were male. Marie's girlfriends decided to leave as a result, but Marie elected to stay. Doolin later told investigators that Marie said she had a ride back to her hometown of Hayden, Colorado with an unidentified driver between 1.30 and 2 a.m. on November 21. Doolin stated that this was the last time he saw Marie. Other witnesses placed Marie at a store in Craig in the early morning hours, however, many of the partygoers' statements conflicted one another and there is still confusion as to when Marie was last seen. Marie's parents filed a missing persons report with the police in Hayden when she did not return home the following morning. She has never been heard from again. Police initially suspected that Marie had run away from home but her parents said it was not in her character to do so. Authorities have admitted the initial investigation into her disappearance was mishandled, and crucial witnesses and possible suspects were not interviewed. A week after Marie's disappearance, Doolin was arrested on extortion charges. He admitted to calling Marie's family and demanding $5,000 for their daughter's safe return. Doolin pleaded guilty to telephone harassment and was sentenced to six months in jail and two years on probation. He was later convicted of an unrelated sexual assault. He maintains that he knows nothing about Marie's disappearance, and made the call only to give her family hope that she was still alive. Numerous rumors have circulated about Marie's disappearance ranging from voluntary disappearance to murder. There has been speculation for years that Marie died of a drug overdose at the party and her body was buried somewhere in Craig. Authorities said that witnesses' statements supported that theory. Her case was reopened by authorities in 1999, but excavations to this point have been unsuccessful at locating any evidence connected to her disappearance. Authorities eventually identified two persons of interest in Marie's disappearance besides Doolin. Max Abel Garcia and Steven Steve Skufka, all of them denied involvement in her case. A photo of Skufka is posted below this case summary. He was later convicted of drug charges and sentenced to 12 years in prison, then paroled to live with his mother. He died in an accident in 2012. To the end he maintained his innocence and Marie's disappearance. Marie was a sophomore at Hayden High School at the time she went missing. She was a good student. She is a former Girl Scout and a member of 4-H, and she helped manage her school wrestling team. Her case remains unsolved and foul play is suspected. 8. The murder of Heather Houseth On June 9, 1979, a group of teenagers attended a party in Milwaukee. The party featured a lot of drugs and underage drinking, and one of the teens was Heather Houseth. After leaving the party that night, Heather was attacked. She was sexually assaulted with sticks and suffocated when dirt was shoved into her mouth. Shortly thereafter, a 15-year-old boy who attended the party, and whose name was withheld from the media, was indicted with second-degree murder and sexual assault. He would be acquitted at his trial in October, but that only scratched the surface of this very bizarre case. The key defense witness at the trial was 18-year-old J. Kelly Flom. He testified that the defendant remained at the party for most of the night and was likely still there at the time Halseith died. On October 28, shortly after the defendant's acquittal, Flom's nude body was found dead in a ditch in the nearby town of Nxia. He had been shot twice in the head. Shortly before his death, Flom was seen in the company of another individual who had attended the same party. Three days later the police were called and tipped off that a local 15-year-old's basement would contain clothes covered in blood and mud that would link the kid to the rape, murder. The police got a warrant but found no clothes that suggested the young man was involved. 
The 15-year-old took a polygraph and failed. The investigators suspected he knew more than he was saying, but they had reached a dead end with a lead. The police had another lead to follow and a different 15-year-old boy, who was not named due to his age, was arrested. He failed a polygraph and was charged with second-degree murder and for the sexual attack. At his trial another party-goer named Jay Flom testified that the accused had remained at the party for most of the night, and was probably still there when Heather was assaulted. This, along with a lack of strong evidence, led to the 15-year-old being acquitted. Soon after the trial Flom himself was found naked in a ditch, dead from two bullet wounds to the head. Flom had been seen with another of the kids from the party shortly before his death. The lawyer who was defending the accused 15-year-old was contacted by persons unknown and warned to not investigate Flom's murder. There is some evidence to believe Flom was the person who called the police earlier about the location of the bloody clothes. Both Halseth and Flom's murders remain unsolved. 9. The Disappearance of Sam Todd It is to be expected that in a city as dense and complex as New York there will always be unsolved mysteries. But none in recent years has been any more unexpected or baffling than the disappearance of Samuel Dodd, the 24-year-old Yale Divinity School student who fell from sight in the early morning hours of New Year's Day. Described by friends and family as quiet and gentle and particularly solid and stable, he did not fit the profile of someone who might suddenly run off and go into hiding. The police believe that because there has been no negative information or evidence, there's a good likelihood he's alive. But finding him is a torturous process, full of psychic shoals. We try not to put too much emotional investment into every report of a possible sighting, said Adam Dodd, 22, one of his three brothers. We're afraid to be disappointed. Nonetheless the search has been one of the most intensive and dedicated in memory here. For what distinguishes the Todd case is the network of family and friends who combed the city for him in the early weeks, some still do and who are now spreading the hunt nationwide. Thousands of flyers have been posted around the city bearing photographs of Samuel as well as a physical description. 5 feet 11 inches, slim, 135 pounds, light brown hair, blue eyes, and dark frame glasses. Yale Divinity students and other friends are still coming in on weekends to replace the posters, where they've been taken down and continue the search for information. The Todd case is different, says Lieutenant. George Greenberg, head of the missing persons squad, because of his different social stratum, being a divinity student at Yale. Most of the cases we handle are kids from broken homes, and they usually return home within 48 to 72 hours. This overworked police unit is still pressing hard on the case, though there are no strong leads. Most recently, all the policemen involved in the successful drug sweep on the Lower East Side were alerted to the details of the case because that area borders the neighborhood where Samuel Todd disappeared. It happened around 2 a.m. on New Year's Day after a night of holiday partying and drinking with his brother Adam, and six of his friends from his undergraduate days at Vassar. At their third stop, a party in a second-story loft on Mulberry Street, Samuel told his brother he had drunk too much and his head was spinning. He went down to the street to get some air shrugged off Adam's offer to join him and was last seen by his brother as he began jogging the half block toward Hudson Street. He never returned. Samuel was an avid runner, keeping in shape with regular jogging. He was also an accomplished jazz drummer. More centrally, he was concerned about peace issues and urban problems and was committed to helping the poor. He had worked in a soup kitchen and a food pantry in New Haven. He was soon to be ordained as a Presbyterian minister, his father's vocation. One hopes that knowledge of these pieces of his character may help someone find him. It is not unusual in such cases for people with clues to hang back for a variety of reasons, including a wish to avoid public attention or the police. A cab driver who saw then six-year-old Eden Pats on the day of his abduction in 1979 didn't come forward until late 1982, to report the incident because I had problems of my own. I didn't want to get involved. The boy is still missing. The Todd family has limited means, but with the help of friends they are offering a $5,000 reward for news about Samuel. Anyone with any information at all should call the missing person's number, 3746913.
Fresh posters and search materials have been sent by the Tons to friends and church associates in major cities around the country in an effort to keep the hunt from flagging. This effort has turned up a possible sighting in the San Francisco area, where Samuel spent the summer a couple of years ago. A Barclay woman who came across the poster in February reported that a young man who seemed to fit Samuel's description had been in her Presbyterian church in the middle of January. The police there have been asked to look into it. The family, meanwhile, tries to keep its spirits up. Adam, a paralegal employee in a law firm here, says he believes that what happened to his brother was something bizarre in a positive sense, such as flipping out or breaking down or becoming confused, as a result of someone mugging him or pulling a knife on him. He was a pretty sensitive person, Adam went on. He believed strongly in universal salvation, that everybody has a good side, that everybody will be saved. Adam stressed, however, that Samuel was not naive. We lived for a time in East Harlem. He had been mugged before. It would be nice, rather wonderful in fact. If Samuel's faith in human nature were rewarded by someone coming forward with information now. 10. The mysterious death of Clayton Miller, a retired nurse in Cape Breton, whose examination of Clayton Miller's autopsy results has prompted a review by the province of Nova Scotia says she has confidence in the upcoming investigation into the teenager's death nearly 25 years ago. Miller, a 17-year-old from New Waterford, died in May 1990, following a police raid on a teenage drinking party in the woods on a Friday night. His body was not discovered until Sunday afternoon. Two autopsies concluded his death was accidental, but his family believes Miller was murdered. Kate Dwyer's 30-page report has raised many questions about the two autopsies, performed three years apart. She said she found a number of discrepancies, and omissions in the reports that raise some troubling questions. For instance, Dwyer said Miller's elbows were dislocated, indicating signs of a possible struggle when he was alive, or that he was moved in a violent manner when he was dead. Miller's body also had teeth missing, even though his parents said he had perfect teeth. In an unusual twist, his brain is missing, it was not with the rest of his remains following the first autopsy. Dwyer said there are other inconsistencies in the autopsy reports, including the fact that Miller's body did not have a single bug bite despite being outside for nearly two days. She said she analyzed autopsy pictures and could see a large gash on the teenager's head, an observation not reflected in the autopsy reports. A fresh look by the medical examiner should provide some answers, said Dwyer. There's no photographs where he was found dead, there's no diagrammatic of his lacerations, what the pathologist did. There's a lot of breaches of procedure, she said. With modern technology and photography, mass spectrometry, microscopes, electron microscopes, the expertise of the coroner's office presently, I have every confidence that they will find out. You can't ever be absolutely certain, but I think there's enough there that, yes. The chief medical examiner's office will determine what caused Clayton's death. Crime scene not preserved. Gervais and Maureen Miller are convinced there's more to their son's death than what police have told them. After Clayton Miller disappeared that Friday in May, his parents went looking for him. They say a family friend was the first to tell them their son's body had been found two days later on Sunday morning, not the police, who were aware their son was missing. When the Millers arrived at the crime scene, they saw their son lying face down in a stream. Miller said he ran to his son's body and attempted to lift it out of the stream. He said at first, police said he shouldn't, but then one of the officers helped him. I took one arm and shoulder and the police that had investigated grabbed his other arm and shoulder and we just picked him up and dragged him out of the water, said Miller. They shouldn't have been helping me do that. They should have stopped me from doing that. There were also no photographs taken of the scene. I have great concern that the police were involved, said Ray Wagner, the lawyer for the Millers. From looking at where Clayton was seen, where he was going, the evidence that he was seen in the police station, whether that's true or not, the fact of all the forensic evidence, the fact that he had two dislocated elbows, more in keeping with where his hands would have been held behind his back and pulled with great strength and force. Wagner said people out there know what happened to Clayton. There are a lot of people carrying dark secrets, in my mind, he said. Miller family wants answers. Dwyer was among the hundreds of Miller family supporters, 
who walked with the family on Sunday along Plummer Avenue in New Waterford. Gervais Miller has walked the route nearly every day for the past 24 years, carrying a sign demanding justice for his son. Until we get justice for Clayton, I'm trying to keep it alive and have people ask questions, he said. I hope in the near future I can put it down. He said it's all been worthwhile, given the way the community has come out to walk with him. It's not just Maureen and Gervy anymore. Now it's Maureen and Gervy and their lawyer, and the people, the public. It means the world, said Miller. Miller said he won't rest until there's justice for his son. We hope they find what we've been looking at all along. We hope they find what's right, he said. Maureen Miller said her family just wants the truth. We know Clayton was murdered. We want the people responsible, the ones who laid a hand on Clayton. We want them where they should be. We want them behind bars. She said. Gervais Miller said the province's review will not only reopen the case, but put the police investigation under the microscope.